Hello, welcome to another one. And I'm starting this one just on the outskirts of Geraldton, uh, checking out the golf balls. What the locals call them, but this is the Australian Defence Satellite Communication Station, just out of Geraldton, and well, it's just a good little starting spot, I guess. Um, we're going to head off from Geraldton. We're going to head towards through Murchison, somewhere along there, along the Woolwagon Pathway, and then sort of turn off the Woolwagon Pathway to Mount Augusta, and try and spend a couple of days out there checking out Mount Augusta, doing some walks, and just I guess seeing the biggest monolith, Australia's biggest monolith. This is sort of going to be well, my biggest sort of trip in the last, I guess, couple of months. Uh, taking a week off work, haven't really got a day to be back, so we're just going to wing it, see how long we can last out there. Plenty of food, plenty of water. What else can we ask for? We'll get into it, I guess. And we've had plenty of rain in the Midwest and the Murchison area, so the flies are going to be exactly like this. Pretty horrendous, but we'll get over that. Anyway, the Australian Defence Satellite Communications Station which is, we've always known it as the golf balls because, well, they look like golf balls. But an interesting little stop just out of Geraldton. And this satellite communication station just out of Geraldton has 72 station personnel. Uh, and it's a very, I guess, hush-hush little spot, this one. We've always heard stories of, I mean, cameras in trees and things like that, but... Yeah, you don't really hear too much about it, and it's just another little interesting thing just out of Geraldton that not many people actually know about. But anyway, that's going to do us here, because we just can't really find out any sort of information of that. Um, it's doing its job, it's protecting us, I guess. But let's get on out of here. And I'm going to be heading out towards Murchison, so it's about 2 o'clock now. We had a bit of a hectic day today. Uh, currently moving houses as well, which is a bit of a pain. Flat out work, moving houses. Haven't really had time to do anything, so the videos are sort of a last resort thing, but we've got a week off, got plenty of time to make some videos, so that's gonna be a good thing. Summary. So I'll probably spend about two, two or three hours tonight driving out towards Murchison, see what we can see along the way. Um, haven't really got a camp spot in mind, but that's the beauty about having the rooftop tent. We can just sort of pull up anywhere, get off the road a little bit and have a little camp. Anyway, let's get out of here. So one thing I did completely forget to get was firewood, which was a huge sort of bugger, but have a look at that. Driving along towards Mullawa, just out of Mullawa, there's actually loads of firewood. Looks like they've just done, I guess, all the pruning, the cutting back, slashing, whatever you call it. And I've managed to get, well, pretty much a full bag. Full drifter bags, probably not made for firewood, but I don't, know, I don't want to put it in the car. Um, but happy days there, we've got a full bag of firewood, so that's bloody awesome. But we'll keep on getting on. Oh, look at that one. Last piece. Happy days, that's a good one. So I've come to my first little stop and it's a little point of interest on wiki camps and it's called Huey's Rock. Uh, or Huey's Rocks, not too sure, I'll leave it down below there. Plenty of flies about and not too much to see here. There's a couple of pictures on wiki camps where there's a fair bit of water in here. Um, but it doesn't look like there's much water here. There's a little plaque here we'll have a little look at and then we'll go for a walk down there. There's a little bit of water I can see. See if we can see something down there. But on the park here, Degray Mullawa Root Huey's Rocks. A reserve of 2,000 acres was gazetted around the rocks in January 1880. The earliest on this trail, the water supply lies in a deep pool in Huey's Rocks Creek. Pads, animal pathways leading into the water, are used by sheep, kangaroos, goats, and goats in the evenings. Please do not disturb them. That's interesting. So it'll be an interesting little spot to camp up for the night. And uh, try and get the camera on somewhere around the water. But we're not going to stop here for a camp. We're going to keep on going. Not too far. I'd say another half an hour, maybe. Um, I have got a bit of a tendency of just keeping on going and realising 
that I've got to find camp once the sun's already down, which isn't really a problem with the roof topper, but it is a problem when you're cooking and fluffing around at night time in the dark. But anyway, we'll have a little look down here, see what we can see. Oh, there's some pads, I believe they call them. Footprints of different animals. No idea what these ones are. Emu, maybe, I'm not too sure. Anywho, I'll keep on moving on from here and try and find a little, nice little camp spot. So it looks like I've done it again. Um, just arrived here at Ballinu Bridge, Ballinu Bridge, and the sun's literally just gone behind those clouds, which is a bit of a bugger. Um, shouldn't be too long here. We'll try and find a nice little camp, get a fire on, set everything up, and touch wood. Should be a little bit of light left, but uh, I'll see how I'll go. I'll see if I can find a nice little camp down in there somewhere. Now, I feel like I'm the only one here. I've come in almost as far as you can go. There's another little track going that way, which I might follow it down, but I do want to stop and see them. If you can see them out in the river there, black swans, which is really cool. I haven't seen them in oh, ages now. But really cool to see four black swans swimming around. Paddling around. Oh, there's more over there as well. There's loads of them. See if we can get a bit closer. Now that's cool. So I've come to the other side of the bridge just because there was a sign saying trespassers will be shot private property, which is a bit extreme. I don't know what's going on there. So just going to come down there. Nice little area here. That should be right. That should be soothing, hopefully. But I'll see how that goes. But what a beautiful little spot this is. Try and pop that tent up real quick and try and get a nice little fire on down here. So I can kick back, have a beer, and just relax, really. But we'll get that tent up and we'll get a fire on quick. It's the next morning and flies are up early, cows are up early and the birds are up early. Um, all morning, even before the sun came up, birds flying around here, dropping in the water and chirping away, which is a good little morning that one. But the flies are out in force, huge force. Um, so I think we're just gonna put the kettle on, do a bit of a clean up and then get out of here. Head that way, which I'm hoping the weather's gonna stay kind for us because it is sort of, well, it's all mostly dirt road, which is a bit of a pain. Um, but anyway, we'll get all this packed up. We'll uh, get everything cleaned up. We'll get the kettle on and get out of here. We'll try and get the drone up as well on the way out of here, just to follow this river along because it's a nice little river. And loads of bird life as well. We've got swans down the other end, black swans down the other end, loads of these little birds. And I do believe I did see ducks last night flying through, but I don't know. We'll see what we can see with the drone. Let's get this packed up because these flies are incredible.
Well, these flies are just too much here for me, so I'm out of here. Keep heading towards Murchison. I think it's about 80 odd k's away. So just at the end of the little, I guess the bridge turn in pocket, they've got this, it must be the original bridge here. West Australia's second oldest concrete bridge, constructed in 1929, 1930. The original Ballinue Bridge. Deterioration and limited load carrying capacity led to the original bridge being replaced in 2015. This span is from the original Ballinue Bridge and has been preserved to recognise the historic significance of the original bridge structure. That's interesting. Still loads of flies though. Some interesting little photos and information there about the original bridge. Costing a total of 9,400 pounds. Construction took 14 months to complete with three floods delaying the works. Interesting. Righto. I'm getting out of here. These flies are incredible. So our first stop for the day is the Woolene Wool Shed ruins uh which is on the where are we well we're on the wool wagon pathway um we're not going to be staying out the whole time but we may as well see everything along the way here but this is the woolene wool shed or the ruins of the woolene wool shed historic shearing shed destroyed by a storm december uh, 27th of december 2004 around 2 p.m a severe storm or cockeyed bob struck, leaving major destruction in its wake. The owners of the station, Brett and Helen Pollock, who the station's about five, ten minute drive back down that way. Uh, they do do accommodation, river stays and things like that. I think it's about $30 a night, which apparently on Wikicamp's well worth it, but that's, we're not going to get into that today. Um, they described the 20 minute storm as worse than a cyclone. The storm, which was about a kilometre wide, with wind gusts up to 150 kilometers per hour. And a really interesting little read here as well about how the shed was, I guess, constructed, built, uh, when it was built. I believe it was 1922, the Woolleen Wool Shed. So interesting little read there, and also this little bit here. Originally a 12 stand shed, it is estimated that over a million sheep would have been shorn in the shed, resulting in 30,000 bales of wool for export. So a lot of history here. I guess we'll go for a little drive in there. There's a couple of cars in there, a couple of cruisers in there, having a little look around. So we'll get in there, see what we can see, and keep on moving. So coming in here, these look like to be the old, I guess, shearing quarters. Not too sure what that one is. Or oh, that one down there might be some more quarters. But it's interesting, it's got, all got power lines going everywhere. And it's just been looked after and preserved so well. There's a couple little doors open. We're going to have a look in there. All right, so. There the shearers quarters, you've got rooms either side. These look like to be the dunnies. And these ones, still not too sure. They look like more rooms. And then I'm not too sure what this one is. There's no little information things or anything. 
Um, I don't really want to go open any doors. If we've got an open window, we'll poke our head in there, but oh, they're all padlocked anyway. And this looks like to be the original shed here. Tim floorboards. And I don't know, that looks like wool over there. Not too sure, maybe. Sort of the remnants of wool. And by the looks as well, a lot of the tin, or well the galvanised, whatever it is, the tin off the roof, ended up down there right along the river. So it must have been a pretty big storm to come through here and just completely wipe this out. And weird that it didn't wipe these ones out either. hit the road again and um, head off towards Murchison. But that is the Woolene wool shed, or what's left of it. And the shearing quarters there. Good little look around, good little walk around, and good that it's just been, I guess, left alone. No one's really come and smashed it all up or whatever, stolen anything. Everything's sort of just been left there, which is really good. But it's time to get back on the road and get over to Murchison, see what's going on there. So this is Murchison, small little town on the way through, I guess the Murchison area. Um, not a lot here. They've got a little shop over there, toilets, caravan park, and that's really it. Uh, there's a little museum over there somewhere, which I've got to find and see if it's open. Hopefully it's open because I've been recommended to check it out. So try and get over there. We'll go. So this is the town of Murchison. Um, not a lot going on here, not too many people live here. There's a caravan park, little shop, and that's about it really. There's a couple of houses over the back there and a museum, which I've been told to go and check out. Hopefully it's open. And I believe it's 20 bucks a night for the caravan park here, which all looks fairly brand new. Just the only problem here is there's no potable water and there's no phone reception, which is a huge bugger. Can't ring Soch tonight which I've got to do. So we've got to find somewhere tonight uh, with a bit of signal. Anyway, we'll have some lunch and uh, go over there, head over to the museum. Hopefully it's open for us. So just over the back of where we parked is the museum, which I'm not too sure if it's open or not. Apparently you can just walk around and have a little look around. So we're going to do that as it's threatening to rain. So we'll try and get under cover there and um, try and be quick.
so has got a sign there please do walk in so may as well That's a cool little drawer sort of pantry system. Really interesting. The hand painted Royal Ivory Adams. So a huge amount of history here in this museum, all donated by, I guess, by all the different stations around here, the different locals, everyone around this Murchison, I guess, Gascoigne region. But uh, that's gonna do me, I think. Really interesting little stuff over here. I guess we'll flick the lights off and move on. And before we go, these are another little thing, interesting thing. Um, I believe there is a radio communications field or array field out somewhere around this Murchison area. Uh, you've got to turn off all radio signals, phones, CB radios, pretty much everything as you're driving through it. And these are the little things that are out there. I'll leave it below what it is and the website you can check it out, but I think it's a field array system or something like that. It's really interesting to see this. So just out of Murchison, uh, not even five kilometers, the next little stop, like turn in, turn off, Erebitty Bluff and Erebitty Out Camp. They are two more little stops on the Woolwagon pathway and we're here, we may as well duck in there, have a little look. Uh, apparently the roads pretty average don't go down it after rain we had a couple of spits and it's sort of moved out that way so yeah might as well go in there check it out have a little look around 
Um, but it might be a bit of a late night tonight, getting into somewhere with signal, trying to find signal. Um, I don't know. We'll see how we go. If it's a late night, we'll get over it. But I don't really want to go drive past things and not see things. So let's get in there. Well, Erebidi out camp. And by the looks of it, there's not a lot here. Remnants of an old out camp. Some trees. And a plaque. Which is going to be pretty tough to read because it's sort of very faded. So they're Currajong trees planted as seeds by Mary Watson's husband in the early 1920s. And it goes on here to where well, you can't really see much, but I can see a little bit. The life story of Mary Watson. Um, she's one of a family of 12. Never been away from home until she was married in 1921 at the tender age of 18. Her husband was the cook at Woolene Station. And they were both sent out to here. Erebidi Out Camp, 50 kilometres away from the Woolene Station. Head on to the next one. Um, I believe it is Erebidi Bluff. Uh, I think it's just up there, that little hill straight up the top there. But these flies are driving me nuts, so moving on. So this is Erebidi Bluff. And that is a beautiful view, that. Absolutely stunning. Really something else. And apparently you can drive to the top of it. Uh, it says it on Wikicamps, so I'm not too sure. Don't know if it'll say it here. Nothing really there. So not much information, just a bit of information on how these were used as, well not as, for explorers. Uh, back in the day, exploring this country. Get up right up high there and you can see for miles and miles. But nothing really else here. Um, we'll go for a quick little drive just up there a little bit, see if he actually can get up the top there. Because it'll be pretty awesome if we can. So it looks like the track detours off from going up that hill to going up this small little hill here. Um, I'll get up there. Apparently there's a little barbecue area up there and a lot of people do stay the night there. I don't think we're going to, it's a bit, it's only two o'clock in the afternoon, we've still got some ground to cover. And there's still, there's no signal here as well, so. Anyway, I'll get up there. Um, not too sure if that track does go up there, eventually up there, but there's just nothing on Hema. And nothing on wiki camps there. Well, how's that? This has got to be an absolute incredible little spot, this one. How's that for a backdrop? What a beautiful spot. It'd just be an incredible spot to camp. Watch the sun go down off those rocks there. That'd be beautiful. And by the looks of having that fire there, or barbecue there, must be a pretty, pretty hot spot for locals to come and camp here. Or barbecue here. It's just a great spot. Again, millions of flies. I don't know how people live out here with all these flies. They drive me bloody nuts. But I'll get the drone up, try and get some nice footage of that mountain there.
So another little stop on the wool wagon pathway is opening gates. Um, goes to explain, before cattle grids like that one up there, they were simply gates just like that. And truck drivers, well, they weren't really a fan of them as it numbered around, or nearly a hundred gates. So the truck drivers used to drive in convoy. Uh, first one at the gate, open the gate, and then rejoin the back of the convoy, and then keep on traveling, keep on going like that. So not much here, but we'll have a look at this little gate here, and driving this road, if I was to stop a hundred times to open gates up, God, that'd be a nightmare. But they used to do it, didn't they, before cattle grids? So not much else to see here. I think I'll just keep on moving, really. Head up to the next point of interest. So I've got 213 kilometers to Gascoigne Junction. Uh, it's 3.30 now. And still a couple of other things I've got to see on the way, on the way with this wool wagon pathway. So I've made the decision, not gonna be going into Gascoigne Junction tonight. Um, so no signal tonight, won't be ringing Soch, but that gives us a bit of extra time to have a look at these little points of interest along the way and touch wood fingers crossed get a campfire on nice and early before the sun goes down before it gets too late so let's go so i believe this is going to be one of the last stops for the night this is stock route well number 19 and a little bit of information. There's the well there in the back. And Et Hooley Stock Route Well 19, proudly restored in partnership by the Geraldton Four Drive Club and Foothills Four Drive Club, Incorporated, June 2007. And I haven't read a thing on this yet. On the 27th of May 1866, the pioneer bushman E.T. Hooley left the Geraldine mine just north of Northampton with 1,945 sheep. The intent of driving them all the way to the Ashburton region, approximately 1,500 kilometers to the north. He arrived in the Ashburton River on the 25th of August, having lost only eight sheep. Four months later, wow. Four months to do 1,500 Ks. <laughs> Big effort, that. Good on him. And his remarkable overland journey led ultimately to the establishment of the Mullower de Grey stock route in 1890s. And in 1895, the government of the day engaged a well sinking party led by a Mr. Staker. Their task was to construct wells roughly 12 to 20 kilometres apart along this route to augment those dug by Mr. Hooley some 30 years before. Each well was required to be capable of watering 3,000 sheep or 300 cattle, and a total of 52 were dug and equipped with troughs, buckets, and either a windlass or a whip lever for raising the water. This is well 19, originally dug to 33 feet and yielding approximately 125 gallons per hour. And in the 1950s, road transport finally overtook driving as the most efficient way of moving stock, and routes such as this were abandoned. Only wells like this one remind us, remain to remind us of E.T. Hooley and those who came after him. So a good bit of information. And restored in 2007, so what's that? 13, 15 years ago? Still in pretty good condition. But that's about it. Millions of flies, so I'm gonna keep on getting on here, try and find a camp. So this has just come out of the blue, and I'm not too sure what to expect here. I'm hoping it's only a little sun shower and we just pass through it. If not, well, hopefully it's, hopefully it's not gonna last all night. Wait and see there. So, I think this is going to be my little spot for the night. This is, well, this is not Billung Pool. 
Bilung Pool is just over there, about four or five hundred metres. That's the main road there. On oh, the dirt road. Uh, Bilung Pool is completely ram-packed. There's about six, seven caravans in there. I don't know if they're all together or not, but it's usual. I think I've been to Bilung Pool twice before and it's been pretty ram-packed. Beautiful little spot, but just on the other side of the road. There's this little spot which caught my eye. And I'm not going to complain with this. This is going to do us a little sort of fire going on there. We'll make a little fire. Try and park the car up a little bit straighter, flatter, and I guess set everything up. I'm not too sure if that rain's going to come in. It did clear up pretty quick before. Well, it can't get much better than this. Fire's on, beer in hand, and this beautiful view. The sun's only just gone behind those clouds there. And it's gonna be an absolutely top night, um, so long as these flies die down a bit. But you can't go wrong with a little spot like this. And I was gonna put the awning out, but I think it's just gonna to be too much of a pain to bang the pegs into this rocky ground. If I was staying here a couple of days, I'd probably do it, most likely do it, but just an overnighter, I don't think there's any point. Uh, it should be reasonably quick in the morning anyway, if it is raining. Um, picked up a duck pancake kit from Aldi on special. But silly me, didn't read the instructions. It is ready in 10 minutes in a microwave. And we haven't got a microwave. We've got a, well, I haven't got a microwave. Got a little oven, which is, I don't know. I guess we'll just chuck it in there and see what happens. Can't be that bad. And I guess I'll end this video here. Um, first two days on our little trip to Mount Augustus. And we've been through... Murchison and on the wool wagon pathway. I uh, hope you enjoyed it and on the next episode we'll be going into Gascoigne Junction and then heading up into Mount Augustus, touch wood. Anyway, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it as much as these flies enjoy me and we'll see you on the next one. And this is going to be a bit of a good start to the video. Flies everywhere. That's a video. Oh, had a walk around here, Woolleen Station. No, not Woolleen. So another little stop on the Woolworthy. Meh.